Okay, so I just handed out. I just handed out um, a listing of topics that is not complete. So if there's something that's not on this sheet, um, because I I kind of went through it quickly, so if it's missing something, that's not my problem. Um, but it's pretty extensive. And then it also tells you where, um, at least on Canvas and maybe in the old exams, where to find extra problems in addition to what's in Sapling. We're, we will not um, actually cover E1 on this test. It has Chapter 9. Chapter 9 will not be on the test because I'm going to kind of mop up SN1 and SN2 today. And then we'll talk a little bit about rearrangements, carbocation rearrangements on Monday. So we'll postpone um, E1 until after the exam. So the exam is going to be kind of some from previous exam ones and then some, most of the stuff from, from current or from previous exam twos. So an exam one is where the Newmans and chairs are and then exam two has everything except it also has free radical halogenation which is next semester. So, so you can take a look at that. Um, there are some there are some extra problems on Canvas, and it kind of tells you where those are. Okay. So, and then also there'll be a take-home quiz for Monday, which I have here, of writing mechanisms of an SN1 and an SN2 reaction. Okay. All right, any questions? Um... When you're registering for organic next semester, regardless of the section, I think you have to put in both the lab and the lecture because they are still co-requisites. There's no waiting list because the waiting list doesn't work with co-requisites, but you have to put in both of them at the same time you push the button or else it won't let you register. And another question that I got was... Can you switch? Yeah, you, I mean, you can switch. The, the topics that Dr. Kwan and I are covering are basically the same. It's just we're using a slightly different book. So it, it's not, no one would be totally lost if they, if they switched one to the other. Because Faith came in and she's like, you forced them to stay into the same class. Number one, most people do stay with the same teacher. Number two, I didn't force anybody to do anything. And number three, you could switch. It would just, um, it's ultimately going to end up where he and I, where he and I end up at the end of the semester will we'll be pretty close. Bobby? He uses the Wade book. It's called Wade. You could, you could find the seventh edition of that book. And it would be far less. Yeah, the Wade book. It's it's a, you could use the seventh, eighth, or ninth edition. It doesn't either. Even the sixth edition is okay for that. Yeah, if you had to, you could get away with the sixth or seventh edition. I think I've got a seventh edition in my office. If you search online, well, okay, this is a violation of of intellectual property. But if you searched online like free Wade eighth edition, it might take you to a Saudi Arabian website <laughs> where the entire PDF of the book is is located. I cannot condone I cannot condone such activities because that's an intellectual property violation of the textbook publishers. But it might be out there. Well, you you guys got Chegg and all these other things, right? You can pay your 15 bucks and go behind the firewall and get it and, and then come back. So I'm not telling you anything you probably don't know. Okay. Now what I want to start with is, as I get my mind there, is let's go back to where we ended class on 
Wednesday. So here's what we were talking about. We were talking about we want to make a we want to make a table to predict whether a reaction undergoes SN1 or SN2. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, primary alkyl halide undergoes SN2 only. Why? Because it can't form a carbocation, so that eliminates the SN1 mechanism. It's not sterically hindered, so SN2 is okay. Secondary alkyl halide can undergo either SN2 or SN1. It can form a carbocation. It's not too sterically hindered. It could do either one. Tertiary halide, SN1 only. Because it's too sterically hindered to undergo SN2, and it is um, able to form a stable carbocation. Okay. As far as the nucleophiles go, if we have a strong nucleophile, which means it has a negative charge, it can do either SN2 or it can do SN1. It can come in, it can kick off a leaving group, or it can react with carbocation. However, the weak nucleophiles, like water and alcohols, they can only undergo SN1. So if we, and we know these, we're not guessing at these, right? We're not even really memorizing these because we can think through why each of these can only undergo the reaction that is there. So we can put this together in a table where we would say, okay, um, what kind of alkyl halide do we have? What about a strong nucleophile? What about a weak nucleophile? And then say, okay, primary, secondary, tertiary, And I think Top Hat does this. They go through the development of this, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take everything that's in common now. So primary halide plus a strong nucleophile. What do we think? that's it. Secondary plus a strong nucleophile. Well, what we're going to say here is that it has to undergo SN2 as well because a strong nucleophile is going to favor an SN2. Strong nucleophiles like to attack and if I guess if they were sterically hindered then they would wait for the molecule to form a carbocation and then add. And a tertiary halide is going to be SN1. So tertiary halide plus strong nucleophiles SN1. Secondary plus strong nucleophiles SN2. Primary plus strong nucleophiles SN2. Now what about tertiary plus a weak nucleophile? SN1. Tertiaries can only undergo SN1. Secondary. Well, if I take a secondary and I react it with a weak nucleophile, and the weak nucleophile can only react with a carbocation, it forces it then to go SN1. And then for the primary plus a weak nucleophile, weak nucleophiles can again only react with carbocations since primaries cannot form them, we get no reaction. with an alkyl halide. I suppose if I made the leaving group better, I could get the, I could get a neutral nucleophile to react, but we're talking about halides at the moment. So there is our chart. If you had a reaction, you could figure out what mechanism it is. Okay. And you know, whatever you got to do to learn that, you do. If you got to memorize it, if you 
can just think it through, but it it makes logical sense the way I've laid it out. Now I've laid out I've I've uh, eliminated a lot of gray area here that we'll bring back in. We'll bring back in some of the exceptions, and we'll bring back in a little bit of of the sort of gray area that doesn't quite fit this chart. But to start with, we need we need a concrete set of rules. Okay? Because otherwise it just becomes too confusing. And that's and that's the big issue with SN1 and SN2 and E1 and E2. Most people are like, oh I can't handle those. But you can, you just have to remember what the rules are. And then we'll build in some of the exceptions. When I first started teaching the guy who was teaching the majors class in Kansas was, he was like, I don't even believe half of the stuff we teach. And I'm like, okay, maybe you're in the wrong business. But he's like, this SN2 stuff. And I said, well, maybe you're focusing more on the exceptions than the rules. And he didn't think he was, so that's fine. I was teaching the non, the non sort of chemistry pre-med majors. That's students and agricultural students, and it was okay. It was fun. It was the same thing, except less mechanisms. So we want to focus on the on the hardcore rules first, and then we'll then we'll play around the edges. Because the secondary, you might say, well, secondaries can go either way. Let's start with strong nucleophile SN2, weak nucleophile SN1, and then we'll get to some of the nucleophiles are going to get a little tricky too. So that's the table we need to learn. And so when you get a reaction, can you predict if it's SN1 or SN2? Right. And in the homework problems that are in one of the folders, um, it gives you these, but if you use these set of rules, you could do them. Now what you're missing is E1, and that'll come after the exam. And when I add E1 into this table, it's going to be SN1 and E1. So if you see that, that's elimination. That's when we form a double bond. But the first step is the same. It's just instead of a nucleophile attacking the carbocation, I lose an H+. Plus. So we'll get to that. Right? So this is what we need to remember. Right? Is everybody kind of okay with that? So you know, on the exam, you're going to want to um, do that as well. So then the next question is, the next question we need to talk about are solvent effects. So how does the solvent affect the rate of an SN1 or an SN2 reaction? And before we do that, I should, we should review here the idea of what makes a good nucleophile, what makes a poor nucleophile, and then what makes a good leaving group and a poor, poor leaving group. So in terms of leaving group ability, leaving group ability is based on what one thing? Basicity, is it a direct or indirect relationship? Indirect, so strong. So in this case, a strong base is a poor leaving group and vice versa. Okay. What about nucleophilicity? What about nucleophilicity horizontally on the periodic table? What's, what is it based on? Basicity? Do all, we all agree with that? Okay. Strong, stronger bases on the left of the periodic table or on the right side of the periodic table? Left. So basicity. Oh, that's where that's what I did. Wondered why it kept getting bigger and smaller. Basicity increases as we go from right to left.
How about vertically? Polarizability is what comes into play. I forget what's polarizability. Okay, squishiness and also size. So polarizability is is the size, the bigger it is, the more we can deform the electron clouds. So how does polarizability affect nucleophilicity? Does it increase going down or does nucle nucleophilicity increase going up? Down. Okay, so going down it increases. So we have to keep that into, into, into our minds in terms of what's going to make is the leaving group going to be better or worse? Is the nucleophile going to be stronger or weaker? And for nucleophilicity, it depends on whether I'm comparing horizontally or whether I'm comparing vertically. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about of solvent effects. And what kinds of solvents can I do SN2 reactions in? Well, the first priority is that they have to be polar. And the reason they have to be polar is because in some of our reactions we've got a negatively charged nucleophile coming in, kicking off a leaving group that then becomes an anion. So we have an anionic species, so we need a polar solvent that will dissolve them. Okay, we don't normally do SN2 or SN1 reactions in a non-polar solvent. We do it in a polar one. So then there's two types of polar solvents that we can have. We can have what are called protic solvents, and we can have aprotic solvents. Now, the name protic and aprotic kind of implies that one has a proton that it can donate and the other one has a proton that, or doesn't have a proton that it can donate. I don't like these terms. I've never liked these terms since I was a graduate student um, because it's very easy to deprotonate things that you wouldn't normally think are deprotonatable. And so I prefer sort of what's called hydroxylic solvents, which are protic, and non-hydroxylic solvents. Nobody's adopted my terms yet, as far as I know. Not even this book. Although it will once I go back and edit it and put this in. So hydroxylic means it's got an OH group in it. And you can kind of see if it has an OH, you would think that OH proton could be lost. So what solvents have OH groups in them? Water and alcohol. So this would be our big two for hydroxylic. What kinds of solvents don't have OHs in them, but yet they're polar? Some of these we've seen in lab. For instance, what do we use to clean glassware with in lab? We use the acetone, which is polar but doesn't have an OH group. Is it possible to deprotonate acetone? Yes, and that's the reason why I'm not real thrilled about the aprotic term. Um, we also can substitute that carbon with a sulfur, and when we do that, we make a solvent called dimethyl sulfoxide, or DMSO. Anybody heard of DMSO before as a solvent? Use it in reactions. That is for right? Oh, what is it? What's its what's its bad characteristic? That you have to you wear gloves with it. If it gets on your skin, it goes directly into your bloodstream. That's the bad thing. So you got to make sure you wear gloves with it. Um, DMSO sometimes in the popular culture, and I don't know who this is popular with, but people sometimes use it to uh, relieve sore muscles. Remember, 
it goes into your bloodstream. <laughs> and everything that's dissolved in it also goes into your bloodstream. So I, I remember seeing, let's say, I think in West Virginia at one point, there were signs on the free, you know, DMSO sold here. Not to me. <laughs> right? Because you'd have to make sure it's all it's really, really pure um, before it's before it's going into my bloodstream, which it has in the past, pure, pure stuff, kind of take leaves it garlicky taste. But this is a polar covalent solvent. So that's that's the characteristic of DMSO. We also have things like CH3CN, which is called acetonitrile, which is another commonly pol used polar organic solvent. And we'll leave it at that. So these non-hydroxylic solvents are polar enough to dissolve the ionic species. They're not hydroxylic. So we have to clarify what our two solvent camps are here. And then the question is, well, how do they affect the rate of an SN1 or an SN2 reaction? And I'm basically going to deal just with the polar, or with the protic or with the hydroxylic ones. So here is an SN1 mechanism. The rate determining step of, a, of an SN1 reaction is to form carbocation and the leaving group. Now, if I want to make this reaction go faster, I could actually go back to exam one, the last question, and I could make the carbocation more stable. And with the more stable carbocation and invoking Hammond's postulate and the Arrhenius equation, it's going to go faster. But looking at both of these ionic species, if I solvate those better, then I can make this reaction go faster. And so which of those two solvents is going to solvate carbocations and anions better? That's going to be the hydroxylic solvents. So those solvents are going to, to are going to solvate the anions better. What does that do? Going back to our basic principles, it makes the products more. If this if these solvents solvate the anions better, the products become more stable. And so then that will push that will push the reaction to occur faster. Wait, if the products are more stable, the, the reaction goes faster? So the products of this step of the reaction. Okay. Right? These are still intermediates, yeah. but it's the same general rule, right? An intermediate is the product of the first of the first step. So when you solvate it better, you make them more stable, and when you make them more stable, the reaction occurs faster. Does it also allow the, the molecules to orient themselves in a better position to react? Meaning the carbocation? Uh, yes. Well, never mind. That's the second part doesn't, doesn't matter. So, so once, we, once we form a carbocation, this is the structure of the carbocation with the empty p orbital. So actually there's no backside attack to a carbocation. The nucleophile can add either from the top lobe or it could add to the bottom lobe. So there isn't a particular orientation per se like there is in SN2. And remember the 50, the 50 adding 50% 50 on top and 50% on the bottom is why you get a racemic mixture for an SN1 reaction. That's racemic because once you form a carbocation, you're going to get both. Um, you're going to get addition of both lobes. 
So in this case, that means that the hydroxylic solvents or the protic solvents cause SN1 to occur faster. And what about the non or what about the aprotic or non hydroxylic solvents? It's going to go slower because it's, it doesn't solvate as well. So I'm only going to focus on the hydroxylic solvent effects. So what about SN2? In an SN2 reaction, what happens? You have your nucleophile. It's going to come in and add to the carbon with the leaving group. The leaving group is going to leave, and you're going to go through your transition state to make your final product. I'm going to focus on the front part of the reaction. Which solvent is going to solvate the nucleophile the best? Which solvent? Which solvent's gonna gonna solvate that the best? The protic. Is that a good or a bad thing? Which isn't really a question, right? Okay, stop right there. It's gonna stabilize the reactants. Okay. So if it stabilizes that nucleophile, where did you want to go next? That it's going it's not going to as easily move to the reactant side, so it's not going to react to that. Okay. So if we solvate that nucleophile, it's gonna be care it's gonna be dragging a lot of solvent with it. And then before it can react with the carbon, it's got to get rid of that solvent, which is fairly strongly attached. So that's going to slow down the reaction. So whereas solvation in SN1 is good for the products, in SN2 it's not good for the reactants because what it's going to do is it's going to slow down the reaction by, again, better solvating the nucleophile. And so that means just the opposite in SN2. In SN2, your hydroxylic solvents, or, or sorry, protic solvents, those are going to cause the reaction to go slower. So I'm not concerned about the aprotic or the non-hydroxylic solvents. It's the hydroxylic solvents that are having the effect. And if you remember what they do, the aprotic ones do the opposite. Okay. So that's how the solvent groups, how the solvent can affect the, the rate of the reaction. Can you explain one more time why it goes slower in the SNC? Because the solvent is solvating the nucleophile, mm -hmm. so that if you imagine we got all these solvent molecules around it, as the nucleophile, first of all, it's got to drag all that solvent with it, but that's not a big deal. But when it comes time for it to form the bond with the carbon, it's got to shed the solvent in order to react. Okay. And how do you know that there's going to be? Like on one nucleophile, there's going to be so many. I have no idea. Okay. I mean, these things are constantly moving back and forth, right? Oh. I mean, and I know that's a hydrogen because it's delta plus versus the minus. Oh. So the the hydrogen is going to be much more. Um, well, if this is like an OH minus, you'd almost have a hydrogen bond there. So, or you would have a hydrogen bond. So if you were trying to. Both steps as quickly as possible. You could start with a protic solvent and then deprotonate it, then make it go. Uh, like if you were to go from the first step to the next step, like. Well, these are no, these are two totally different mechanisms. 
These are two totally different mechanisms. So you're, I mean, if you're doing SN1, right, you're using a weak nucleophile and you're using like a tertiary halide. If you're doing SN2, you're using like a primary halide with a strong nucleophile. So these are two totally different reactions. What, what I'm saying is that if you did acetone versus ethanol, you ran the reaction in acetone and ethanol, what you would see is you would see the reaction, the SN1 reaction, speed up. If you ran ethanol or acetone versus ethanol in a SN2 reaction, you would see the reaction slow down in, in the alcohol versus the acetone. One of the sections in the book, I think, towards the end of either either the SN1 or SN2 says, how do you know? Right, Because we've created pretty bulletproof rules here on when it's going to be SN1 or SN2. And if you look at some of the old some of the older um, exams, you might see a question that it's usually, what is it? It's usually either, it's usually a Dr. Organovich question because Dr. Setter has the Dr. Marinovich person that is real, that's always, always on exams. So I just modified that. And so the, I'll say, you know, or Pat, because that's a gender neutral name, Pat has this alkyl halide and he wants to know if this reaction is SN1 or SN2, he or she. They want to know if it's SN1 or SN2. How should they, how should they test that? And so one of the first things you'd say is, well, let's double the nucle let's double the nucleophile concentration. And if we double the nucleophile concentration and the rate doubles, I've got an SN2 reaction. What happens if there's no change? It's SN1. What if happens if the rate is kind of in between? Well, then we have both occurring. Can you say that again? <laughs> so if we have a reaction and we want to know, if we have a reaction and we want to know if it's SN1 or SN2, the first thing we could do is change the nucleophile concentration. The nucleophile concentration, when you change it, that only affects what mechanism? SN2. It doesn't affect SN1. You could say, well, I'm going to use a chiral molecule. I'm going to use that molecule in a chiral form. And then what, we, what would we expect? If the product's optically active, it's SN2. If we get a racemic mixture and no rotation, it's SN1. Here's another effect that we can use, the solvent. So we change from an aprotic to a protic solvent or we change from a non-hydroxylic to a hydroxylic solvent, how does that affect the rate? If it slowed it down, it's SN2. If it speeded it up, it's SN1. So we have all these different tools that we can use to determine what the mechanism is. If it's pure SN1, if it's pure SN2, but what you have to realize is, again, reactions are not, I think I've used this analogy before, reactions are not two-lane highways from here to there. They're two-lane highways that go, it's like a fork in the road times five, meaning that you could go this way or this way or that way. You might go halfway there and come back. Equilibrium. Right? It's like you're in the valley looking over all the different mountains. Except the problem is you can see the height of the mountain, but what can't you see on the other side? The depth of the valley. Right? So we need enough energy to get over the, over the peak, 
but we don't know if we're going to gain all that energy back by going down to the bottom of the valley or if it's just the valleys at the, near, the, near the peak. So reactions are complicated and there's more than one pathway. But these are the tools we could use to say, okay, is this reaction SN1 or is it SN2? Is by varying all these different things. Right. Now, what can I not change, though? Or what won't give me any information? What's the effect on the leaving group? Or what's the effect does the leaving group have? So if I take my SN2 reaction and I react my nucleophile with my alkyl halide and I get my trigonal bipyramidal transition state and then I get my final product What do you think the effect of having a better leaving group will be? If I have a better leaving group, is the reaction going to go faster or slower? What's your instinct tell you? Faster? And the reason that, and that's right, the reason that it will go faster is because the leaving group is in the rate determining step. Wait, this is an SN2 reaction. That's the rate determining step. It's the step. Right? It has one step. That's the rate determining step. So anything that shows up in the rate determining step is going to affect the rate. Concentration of nucleophile affects the rate. Leaving group ability affects the rate. Contrast that with SN1 where my first step is to break the leaving group carbon bond to form my carbocation. What's a better leaving group going to do here? Make it faster or slower? Say it. Nobody said anything. Faster, slower. Better leaving group that makes this reaction go faster. faster. Why? Because it's in the right determining step. Because the leaving group's in the right determining step. Yes, it'll be easier to break that bond, whatever easy means, and however easy relates back to kinetics. But the simple fact is, it's in the right determining step. What's not in the rate determining step? The concentration of the nucleophile. So if I make if I make my nucleophile better, what happens? Nothing. Nothing. What about SN2? If I make my nucleophile better, will it make the reaction faster? Yes. Why? It's in the rate determining step. So all these different factors go into play in terms of SN1 and SN2 reactions. And ultimately what we can do is we can begin to compare reactions. So I can create a problem like this. Let's say, what do I have? I've got this. So I'm going to take this plus hydroxide and I'm going to take this one plus hydroxide. And this is reaction A, this is reaction B. Um, let me change classes. And my question is going to be which one of these two reactions occurs faster? Um, 
A or B, or if they occur at the same rate, I'm going to call it C. So which reaction occurs faster? Reaction A, reaction B, or they occur at the same rate, which is C. But if you've answered the first one, take a look at the second one and begin to think about what that answer would be, because I'll ask that next. Is there anybody who can't click in? Okay. Then I'm going to be waiting a long time for the 27th person, am I not? Yes. Okay. All right, I got 20, say A. Okay, good. Maybe. Close the question. Second question. So for the second one that I did. Which one is faster? Yep. Which one's faster, A or B, or the same rate, C? How about I ask you? How about I ask you first? Because I count up the number of people here. Sometimes I get more answers. Sometimes I get less answers. I have no people are answering from home apparently. No, somebody did answer from home the other day. <laughs> They had worked out they were going to be late for class, so I knew that. All right, uh, okay. What do you say? 
Thank you. So we've got we have one B on the board. We have a pretty good split. So remember these this is participation. So tell me what do I need to think about as I'm answering this question? What's the first piece of information when I look at that that I need to say? What kind of reaction is it? SN1 or SN2? Now here's the thing. I can't compare SN1 and SN2. That's comparing, you know, apples to cars. They they're not the same. This week in lab you're going to reflux something for 45 minutes to get an SN2 reaction to go. But wait, that's one step. If I did the same reaction at SN2, or sorry, SN1, I'd put the stuff in a centrifuge tube, I'd shake it, be done. 30 seconds or less. So we can't compare SN1. <laughs> I'm going to be asking myself that question on Tuesday morning and again on Thursday morning. I'm going to ask that same question. We used to do both in the same period, but anyway. So you got to know the reaction mechanism. And then what are we looking at? What's different? Because what's different is going to be maybe faster or slower in the context of the mechanism. So we take the second one, what kind of mechanism? S N. The second one, tertiary halide plus water, NOH minus, SN1. What am I changing? The nucleophile. Okay. Does the nucleophile affect the rate of an SN1 reaction? No. So what would be the answer? C. Okay. All right. So we'll do more of these. We'll do more of these on Monday, Bobby. So are they both SN1 then because they're the same rate? Or? No, they're both SN1 because they're both the same at tertiary al alkyl halide. So it's, C. so it's C because the the effect of the nucleophile doesn't change the rate of an SN1 reaction because it's not in the rate determining step. 